high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated.
cry for his dead friend as much as any of us would for someone for whom we care. Jesus wept. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11 tell us the story of the temptation of Jesus. After his baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, so he was hungry. And the devil challenged Jesus in his hunger to turn the stones that surrounded him, and believe me, there were a lot of them, into bread. He was challenged to put his personal concerns and needs over the concerns and needs of the mission. Jesus wouldn't do it. Then the devil challenged Jesus to throw himself off of the pinnacle of the temple so that the angels would descend from heaven and would catch him. He was challenged to do the spectacular. But once again, Jesus wouldn't do it. And finally, the devil challenged Jesus to worship him and to receive dominion over all the kingdoms of the world. He was challenged to take the easy way, the easy road in bringing the world to himself. Again, Jesus wouldn't do it, but... Matthew 26, 36 through 46 tells us the story of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know these words so well. In those moments before he was betrayed and arrested, Jesus had prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And maybe we can paraphrase that a bit without doing violence to the text to read, Father, I'm tempted not to do this if there is any other way. Of course, we know the rest of the prayer. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, you're free to disagree with me about this, but, but I'm convinced there was at least the possibility that Jesus could have decided against giving himself up for you and Now, the church has historically affirmed that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was both fully human and fully, fully, fully divine. That's what I was trying to say. Every classic creed of the Christian faith has affirmed the full humanness of Jesus as well as his full godness. Now, the mathematics of it, the logic of it, doesn't add up, so don't even try. How does one plus one equal one? Well, don't worry about it. What matters is that we believe that Jesus was fully human, but was fully divine, but also fully human. And it's that full humanness of Jesus which I believe really leads the way to God supplying what we truly need. Now it's really easy to look at Jesus as God walking around in a human shell. But does a God who is just in a shell really know what I think or how I feel or what I need? The testimony of Scripture is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's also the Son of Man. He felt as we feel. He sorrowed as we sorrow. He rejoiced as we rejoice. He was tempted as we are tempted. He didn't give in. And as our lesson from Hebrews reminds us, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Sisters and brothers,
brothers, God knows. God knows. I have to be reminded that in my moments of weakness, God knows. God knows because he's experienced it. When I'm tempted to take the easy way in ministry, when I'm tempted to put personal concerns over the needs of God's people, I have to remember that God in Jesus was also tempted in that way. When I cry because someone I love is dead, I have to be reminded that God in Jesus knows that kind of pain. And in those moments when I'm afraid of dying, I have to be reminded that Jesus didn't want to die either if there was any other way to do it. You see, God knows. God knows. Because our God is the God who knows and who is the God who cares, he stands ready to give us what we need, whether it's wisdom for our decision-making or strength in our weakness or courage when we're afraid or comfort when we sorrow. Whatever it is, God stands ready to give it because God knows. just because we say or do the right things or believe hard enough. God is God. And he does what he does to suit his will. You know, I can't tell you stories about how and I wondered how we were going to pay our bills. An unsought and unexpected gift of generosity came our way. I can tell you stories about how help for other things came from unexpected sources and people. I pastored a number of people who heard their doctors say it's hopeless, only to go for them to go back to their doctors and hear them say, we don't know how, but you're healed. My point is this. I can't promise that God is going to do something miraculous in our lives because I don't fully know the divine mind. I don't know God's purposes fully. But if God chooses to act, let's be open to it. Second, pray. Some of the saying, I knew he was going to say that. That's what preachers are supposed to say, pray. Several years ago, one of my parishioners spent an hour and a half one afternoon berating me for all of the perceived deficiencies that she saw in me as an ordained minister and, and just told me I ought to just get out of the ordained ministry. Now, I didn't know at that time that I could be adult enough to say, stop it, I'm not going to listen to any more of this, or just walk out. So I took this verbal and emotional beating, and afterwards I went into my study to pray. No fancy words, no flowery phrases. In fact, I didn't have any words at all. All I had was a broken heart and a 
lot of people. And in the midst of it, I heard what I believe was the voice of God. And the voice of God said, it will be all right. It will be all right. And it was. A couple of years later, that woman apologized and confessed that she had wronged me. We were reconciled. As you see, I didn't take her advice. I'm still an ordained minister. Scripture invites us to approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folks, that's an invitation to pray. Now, I believe that God already knows what we're praying before we do ourselves, and yet he permits us this privilege of prayer, this privilege of saying to him what he already knows. Because prayer is our admission that we depend on him to strengthen us and to guide us through whatever lies ahead. The privilege of prayer, sisters and brothers, allows us to say before God that we won't make it without him. That we need him because we can't do this by ourselves. there's this oft-neglected part of prayer, and that is listening for God's answer. We talk about prayer as communicating with God, but often our communication is just a one-way street. We talk to God, but we don't really listen for his response. Now, I grant you that the skies do not often open up and the voice of God thunders down. I wish it would. It would make this thing a whole lot easier. Nor is God's response always an audible one. In fact, this incident I just told you about is the only time I can honestly say I believe I heard the voice of God audible. I do believe, however, that God answers prayers through the events of our lives and the guidance of those around us. Doors open. Doors close. People, whether they're conscious of it or not, provide guidance and support and help. And I believe this is God in action, answering our prayers. So we need not only to pray, but to be open to the answer to our prayers. Finally, we don't need to try to go it alone. We need to allow ourselves to be loved and cared for by God's people, by our sisters and brothers. Rosemary was a single mother of two boys, the youngest of whom is a Down syndrome child who's frequently sick and has had a couple of heart surgeries. Rosemary's first husband, the boy's father, for whatever reason, walked out on her and on the boys and offered her only minimal support. At one point when I knew her, Rosemary had used up all of her personal days at work, being with her youngest son, either at the hospital or at home. That meant she wouldn't be paid for any more time off. And her mother said, I'm willing to stay at the hospital so you can go to work. But there were days when Rosemary just felt she needed to be with her son at the hospital, at home. Some of Rosemary's co-workers, who also happened to be members of her church, brought Rosemary's need to the attention of her Sunday school class and of others in the church. And immediately people began to give out of their resources to make up for at least some of what Rosemary was losing financially in trying to be a good mother. It was the blessing from the church and from God that helped Rosemary through a difficult Sisters and brothers, part of our calling as the church is to come to the aid of those in our midst who 
are in need. If we've got troubles, we ought to be able to look to the church, to our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, because the church is supposed to be there to help us. Our need may be physical. Our need may be emotional. Our need may be spiritual, but the church is here as a gift of God's grace to help us in our time of need. Now, these are difficult days, to be sure. But then even good times, they're still difficult days. But ours is a God who knows what we feel because his son has experienced it. And out of his love for us, he provides through miracles, through prayer, through the community of faith. He provides the mercy and grace, the help that we need. So let us go to the one who knows what we need and who will give it because he's been there. He knows where we've been and he knows what we feel. In our moments of pain, in our moments of sorrow, in our moments of weakness and fear, we can turn to our God who is the God who Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Larry is going to come and lead us. And as we're singing this morning, if